So, so, so apparently the A-head, it has its own website, but it says it used to live on the middle of the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so then, then it moved down to the, uh, the, the bottom of the front page, and now it has its own web page. And they said that the A-head, it doesn't scream. So the, the A-head is a headline that doesn't scream, it giggles. So that, that's what we're reading. <laughs> So, welcome to episode 99 of Farm to Markets. This, is, this show is where participants get to state their opinions. And uh, we're not even doing the clock today just because, uh, as we just talked about, I can't be trusted with it. So, this is just a show where participants get to state their opinions, and that's it. There are no prizes, there's nothing else, it's just your opinions. Uh, today, we were talking about uh, this weird bear market. The Fed not talking about the Israeli uh, Hamas war. Cold water immersion again. Uh, Costco clothes and coffee badging. Okay. So we, we are now more than a year from the bear market low of October 2022. And while the bull market isn't exactly raging, stocks are still up more than 20%. And this is a little bit old because uh, they're, they're a little bit lower now, especially over the last couple of weeks. Uh, markets, though, aren't behaving as they usually do at the start of a long-lasting bull market. In some respects, uh, the past year looks more like the tail end. Uh, more looks, looks like more like the tail end of a bull market than the beginning. So, wh why do you think this bull market is uh, is 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 such a such a weird market versus like the past four bull markets? Uh, well, well, the article used used a quote from a former British prime minister that's just events, dear boy, events. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll put it this way: uh, uncertainty, and, and and a lot of quote unquote events that are pulling, I think, both the stock market and the economy in different directions. Um, so, in in general, uncertainty is not a not a fun thing for markets. Markets like certainty. You know, regardless of whatever the rules are, whether they think they're good rules or bad rules, strict rules or loose rules, if the rules are pretty consistent, people can figure out how to make money long term. Um, when when you know policymakers are raising interest rates or uh, regulators are uh, making it more and more difficult to do business overseas versus at home, um, companies are consistently having to try and change change what it is they're doing so that they can continue to try and stay ahead. Um, we have a we have an election coming up. Who knows if you're going to get Donald Trump this time next year uh, cruising back into the White House or, you know, if, if Biden's going to retain office. Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty going on. And on top of that, we, we've got a lot of other interesting things that are kind of going in different directions. So the Fed's raising rates, uh, which in theory should be slowing down the economy. But as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, the government's official policy on different different uh, segments of the economy is to reshore jobs. And that's keeping labor markets tight. Uh, the economy continues to grow in spite of rising rates, even though most of this is big companies that are capturing what the government is actually doing. So if, if you look at like stock market performance, there's only a handful of companies left that are really only driving the, the, the bull market. Most of them are trading sideways or have taken it on the chin. Um, you know, so the, the article mentioned that if, if you want to succeed, maybe you should be buying the companies that are going to be cozying up to the government, like chip manufacturers who are getting ready to capture subsidies, EV manufacturers who like to capture those subsidies. Um, but like we talked about last week, another aspect is we have economists saying there, there may or may not be a recession. They're pretty evenly divided, but consumers and business owners are preparing for the worst. So there's all kinds of different things that, you know, the economists say this, business says this. Um, rates are rising. Fed is trying to slow down the economy, but it's not slowing down. So... I think businesses are trying, just trying to figure out what the next 12 months are going to look like and throw in geopolitical risk, possibility of, you know, su more supply chain disruptions. And I think everybody's just kind of standing pat, you know, they don't really know what quite to do like they do when things are just smooth sailing. The question is, is why does this particular bull market feel different than other ones? It's because, 
only a handful, a, a small handful. I think the article said there's eight companies that have driven the majority, more than half the returns that we've experienced in the last 12 months. That uh, most bear markets, it takes two thirds of the uh, of the stock market to have companies whose stock prices have increased. Uh, where I'm sorry, uh, in, in the past it's been uh, you know closer to 90. You know, 87 and 97 percent is what the article said is what normally is the case. Well, only two two thirds of the stocks have gone up in the last 12 months. And if we take a look over the last quarter, it's significantly less than that. So you've only got a few players that are actually going up in value when everybody else's stock is seems to be on the decline. Uh, what, what's, what's strange about this this bull market is that. Nobody feels like it's a bear market. I mean, even the people who, who are well invested don't feel like they're doing great for a variety of reasons. We, we go out to our favorite restaurant and we find out when we get there that it's closed because they can't find enough workers to, to be open on Wednesdays. Or we, we go to, uh, to the auto parts store and we're trying to get an oil filter and they're back ordered. I haven't seen that particular oil filter in the last six weeks. So it just doesn't feel like things are going well even if the stock prices are on, on, on index funds are up, the, the, the stock price on most of the individual's goods in the stock market are not up. Yeah, uh, all that sounds good. And I think the, the particular vein is that made things really weird is just is the AI enthusiasm that kind of rippled through like right after March, <clears throat> like banks were, were doing bad, but all that, that AI you know, hype from you know, February, January, February, kind of held those those seven big uh, big tech companies like where they are. And for the most part, their earnings, I think micro, I just saw Microsoft beat their earnings. So all, all that, all the, um, you know, all, all the hype that you know, Microsoft, Google, Apple are getting, like they, they seem to be consistently beating their earnings and everything tends to look pretty good for them. So I don't think the, I don't think they're overhyped, but I just think this, that new vein of, you know, we have this new technology, we're going to start rolling it out. Um, that helped those, particularly those big seven companies, stay you know higher while everything else fell. And there's also the you know the the thinking that bigger companies can weather rate hikes better than smaller ones can. So you, yeah, so you're going to see this divergence where you know smaller companies are going to fade away because everybody's afraid of what rate hikes are going to do, and then the bigger companies are going to stick around a little bit more, especially if they have you know new innovative technology. You know that and that based. That's what basically I think caused the diversions in the uh, in the stock market for the year. Everything else basically got hammered, and everything that had AI attached to it—that's a big, you know, a, a you know a, a large cap company—just <clears throat> continued to do well. <clears throat> so, but yeah, everything else is right. And then also, you know, the 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 bear market was kind of weird. You know, we went through COVID, everything was up, you know, extremely high, and then we go through like a mild twenty percent correction, and then you know, so technically we we. Um, we came out of the you know the longest running bull market in history and then went into a bear market and then went into a new bull market so I, I, you know I, I, I don't know i mean some things i mean i would say that this is almost like a continuation of the longest running bull market in history even though technically it ended last october i think that was more of a more of a fluke than it was like an actual ending to the bull market so we're feeling the uh, uh, the uh, later and bull market experience as opposed to the uh, um, the experience of a relatively new bear bull market. Yeah, I, I think I, I would just lump them into one in my head. The, the thing is, is that, you know, and you know, the, the big thing is that everybody's expecting a recession. And if there is the recession that we're expecting to get, I would expect some sort of, you know, stock market correction to go with it. But the thing is, it's just, it's not coming. You know, it's just, you know, we keep saying it's going to be 2023 and it comes. So now the expectation is 2024, you know, so we'll see. But the can keeps getting pushed back. And so who, who knows when it'll actually show up. But that particular forecast keeps getting pushed back. And I think that just prolongs, you know, the bear market that we or the bull market that we've been in. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so this one, so I did diverge from the Wall Street Journal a little bit. And uh, one of the, you know, I was basically looking at a news aggregation website that that uh, fed me this article. I thought it was kind of interesting, but this is this is from CNN. And uh, basically the the author here was was taking um, uh, taking issue with the fact that the Federal Federal Reserve uh, Board governors, um, according to the article, 
uh, th this author thought that they spent way more time talking about the Russia-Ukraine conflict versus the Israel-Hamas conflict. And he thought that more comments from Fed governors are warranted towards Israel-Hamas war versus the Ukraine-Russia war. I mean, do you, do, you, do you agree with him? Do you think Fed officials kind of uh, ignored this? Or do you think it's even worth them commenting on? Why, why do you think they spent more time on Russia, Ukraine versus Israel, Hamas? Well, I, not to minimize what the Israeli people are going through, but uh, from an American standpoint, Israel uh, and Hamas fighting the umpteenth time between one another uh, is kind of small potatoes uh, compared to the prospect of a wider war in Eastern Europe that features the most heavily nuclear armed country on earth and a series of countries with whom we have actual real treaty bound defense commitments with. Um, the, the Israeli conflict with, with, with Hamas, while, you know, it's, it's horrible for the people going through it, they, you know, that does not really have a real life bearing for like 99% of the American people. Um, it's, it's just not going to affect the average person's life. But uh, if, if Russia or one of its key allies all of a sudden, you know, decided to invade the Baltic States, for example, um, now we've got a very real problem. Now, in addition to that, we have the obvious uh, energy energy transportation infrastructure problem, you know, and much of Central and Eastern Europe relies heavily or completely on Russian oil and gas for its economic viability. Just ask Germany how, how much it likes paying five to seven times in the summer, more for electricity than it was just a few years ago. Uh, the results as of now have been the largest deindustrialization in Germany since the fall of the Soviet Union, when everything in Eastern what was once East Germany closed. Um, so fr from that standpoint, there's a far greater real world risk to the global economy and to America's critical core NATO allies than there is, you know, with effectively the city state of Gaza firing rockets and engaging in cross border incursions and murders on Israeli people and the Israelis responding with yet another, you know, bombardment of, of the Gaza Strip. You know, uh, I, I don't think there's any real, un unless this becomes a much wider conflict, there's no real threat to the global economy, to American national security, unlike what you could potentially get in Eastern and Central Europe. If you take a look at uh, President Biden's proposal for the defense spending package of $105 billion, I believe. Ukraine's supposed to get 60 billion of that. And I believe Israel's supposed to get 10 or 15 billion of that. And primarily because the risks or the stakes of U Ukrainian failure there, you know, between Russia and, and Europe is much greater than, than Israel. Is that uh, if we find ourselves fighting to, sa to save NATO or to save one of our greatest trading partners in Europe, which is the European Union, uh, if the Russians take over, that has significant impacts on our world economy. But, you know, Israel, even though they are a trading partner, they're a very, very small one. I don't think they have the same impact on, on the American economy like the Ukraine war does. It's interesting, though, the way the article is written is that there's some sort of expectation that, what, you don't think that these people are as, as, as important as the Ukrainians are? It's not about people. It's about uh, the national, you know, it's, it's the world order. And uh, the Russians are a much bigger risk to uh, to our economic well-being than the Israelis are. Yeah, and this was from CNN. But uh, <clears throat> no, it, it's kind of like, you know, we talked about how uh, that article on how millennials tend to ignore their problems and just hope they go away. It's like, like there's some psychological like aversion or something like that. And part of me wants to say it's just that the Fed sees the fact that we're spending money on the Ukraine Russia war. Now we're supposedly spending money on Israel, the you know, to to support Israel, and they're just like, "How are you going to pay for that? We're just going to ignore it." You know, technically it's not their problem, but you know, they also don't want to draw attention to it. But now Alex is right: is that the conflict does not move the needle much on, on the commodities markets. You know, it's not like Iran has been a big producer in oil, so if they get involved, 
you know, and people start fighting Iran. I mean, they've been sanctioned for years, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, but, and then like, also like Alex pointed out is that Russia is the second biggest oil producer, um, you know, in the world and supplies most of Europe. So if they go to war, obviously that that's an issue more than Israel Hamas would be. So, and then, you know, also, you know, a lot of those, you know, Russia, Ukraine, you know, are on like, are surrounded by NATO countries. So obviously there's more potential there for, for escalation than, uh, than the Israel one. So, yeah, so it's not, it's not about, are these people more important it's about you know what's moving the needle on commodities markets and what's going to move the markets and that's what financial you know the uh, financial journals report on and that's what the fed governors are paying attention to i mean they're not paying attention to the humanitarian side they're just strictly looking at it from an economics point of view and economically this one is not as critical as like a ukraine russia war would be <clears throat> Okay, um, so this, this so like the so the the w, so the Wall Street Journal off-duty menswear stories attracted reader comments that scoff at features uh, scoff at the featured overpriced brands and hail the discount membership uh, retailer Costco for selling just as good designers at smaller prices. Uh, many claim the Kirkland brand. Uh, which is Costco's like private label cl clothing brand. They make other stuff too, but uh, they deliver, you know, un unlimited value for money. So <laughs> what would do, do you, have you tried the Costco clothes? What, what do you think about Costco's, uh, the, the, the private label, label Kirkland brand at Costco? Personally, I don't think I've ever had a Kirkland brand article of clothing. Um, I'm not, I'm not inherently against them. I've just never gotten them. Um, I, I, I don't see why you wouldn't if if your goal is to just get a nice looking shirt or set of pants or whatever. Uh, but I I think the people who are scoffing at the designer labels are not understanding that there is some some status symbol stuff going on here. Um, you don't necessarily buy an eight thousand dollar suit because it's 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 better. It might be better, but you buy it because the the tag on it lets everybody else around you when you hang it up and they see the tag know that you were able to spend eight thousand dollars on that suit um so you know from my standpoint yeah costco or you know whatever other you know just as good brand of clothing is, is fine by me but uh i i i think don't discount pun intended um that there is a status symbol thing going on Years ago, when Lynn and I had just been married for a short bit, uh, we got into this knockdown, drag out fight about something or other. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but uh, she uh, she went for the killing blow and she said, you know, another thing, you have absolutely no fashion sense. So uh, um, my, my, my fashion sense tends to be most of the clothing that I personally buy for myself is usually purchased at Murdoch's Ranch Supply or the thrift store. Now, about once every 15 years, I go and I buy a very, very nice clothes at the men's warehouse or Joseph A. Banks for, for, for the office. But I rarely buy clothes. Occasionally, I have to buy socks or I have to buy you know undershirts or something like that. I have no problem shopping at Costco. Never. Well, I should say never. Not since graduating from high school have I cared about a label. So uh, um, Kirkland clothing is just fine for me. Yeah, I, I would also, I love the deals at Costco. The problem is, is that I'm a smaller guy and everything at Costco, like I think the, the smallest size they have is medium. So I've bought, I've, I've bought pants from Costco and I bought shirts from Costco and it's like I'm wearing my dad's shirt. Um, so for, for whatever reason, like I, they did not have me in mind when uh, they made Costco clothes, which is completely disappointing because they make some nice stuff. So I, I'm stuck with like, uh, you know, like Old Navy, um, which I cringe to, to find out where they get their clothes from. But for whatever reason, it fits better than the stuff. Like people who, the average person who shops at Costco must be like a foot taller than I am. So <laughs> I would buy it, but it just doesn't, it just it's never fit me well. So I have to go other places, but I, I think they have good deals and I, I would not buy, you know, a polo for like a hundred bucks. I just wouldn't do it. So maybe some people would, but I, uh, I, just, I just can't. <clears throat> All right, I skipped uh, cold water immersion here, but um, so, you know, like, you know, as, as the, the, the journal seems to really like cold water immersion therapy, but uh, 
Cold Water, Cold Water Immersion has developed cult-like following, according to the Wall Street Journal, thanks to wellness guru Wim Hof, uh, who I've never heard of, and celebrity aficionados such as Joe Rogan, Kendall Jenner, and Kevin Hart. Fans of the practice claim that along with reducing stress and inflammation, the sudden ice, sen icy sensation boosts mood and mental clarity. So it's probably uh, only a matter of time before entrepreneur, entrepreneur and executive uh, uh, would set up and adopt it as a business meeting and networking tool. So do you think cold water immersion uh, is going to be the next like back nine on the golf course? So when you want to get a deal done, you know, hey, we're going to go jump in this frozen lake versus, you know, play golf. Uh, no, I, I don't think really anything is going to replace golf anytime soon um, as the stereotypical, you know, business business meets pleasure kind of meeting. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if, if it continues to grow as, as, as like a short term health and wellness trend. Uh, but as we've talked about before, it, it looks like all the research on it basically says that unless you just exercised uh, and you want to like re, you know, reduce soreness and speed up recovery time, it's mostly just placebo effect. It makes you feel better, but it doesn't really like do anything. Uh, it doesn't seem like it hurts. So, you know, if, if you want to do it, go ahead. But no, I do not think it's going to be replacing golf. We were talking, you know, before the show started about how the Wall Street Journal is starting to change in, in some of its stories. And this is a, a, you know, a good example of what we were talking about. I, I don't think it's going to replace golf. I, I think that what's going to happen is that something new is going to replace cold water immersion. That uh, this is kind of the, the cool thing that, 28 year old entrepreneurs are doing that 55 year old uh, sales uh, administrators are not doing. And uh, next, next month it'll be parasailing and then it'll be uh, you know, eating you know, insects. And, and then it'll be like, uh, um, you know, you know, dog sleds or something. There'll be something new and, uh, and, and trendy uh, next month when we have our, you know, farm to markets podcast to be talking about. But I don't think this is going to catch on. It's just a weird thing that the particular Gen Z reporter thought might be interesting for its new uh, generation of subscribers. Yeah, for sure. Now, people say golf's like going away and people are losing interest, but it's not. Um, there is a healthy golf community, especially around here. So I'm not worried about it replacing golf, and I hope it doesn't. <clears throat> All right, so last one here is that uh, uh, coffee badging. So coffee badging, like a badge is a workplace trend where employees show up to the office, grab a coffee, then leave then leave the office to work remotely for the rest of the day. It's a way for employees to get around the return to office mandates and save uh, time and money. Um, so, so basically what they do is they come in, they get a cup of coffee, they say hi, hi to their boss, go talk to a couple of coworkers, basically show their face in the office. And then by the time they're done with their cup of coffee, they return home and then spend the rest of the work day at home. But what the, the article is saying is that this this tends to be more harmful to your career than helpful. I mean, do you think coffee badging, how, how, how harmful do you think coffee badging is to, you know, the average employee's career? <laughs> uh, honestly, it's probably, it, it, I guess it really depends. You know, if, if you're in a business where, like the article mentioned, like priority projects uh, that are more likely to get you noticed and promoted are doled out to people who are down the hall from the boss, probably does hurt. Uh, if most of the people in the company are already working remotely and you just kind of show up, say hi, probably doesn't have much of an impact. So I, I guess it would depend. Uh, I think as remote work continues to proliferate over the years and more and more uh, companies who no longer have the sunk cost of, you know, a billion dollar office building that they finished building right before COVID and then need to feel like they get their money's worth before they take it on the chin and sell it. Um, it, it, when, when, when that leaves and more and more people who just kind of work on a computer all day, every day, just don't even have to show up anymore. I, I don't think this is even going to be an issue. I, I think the just state of the, uh, the, the current worker culture is that uh, there's a certain level of security that I don't remember when I entered the workforce, you know, 45 years ago is you, you're, you're almost scared of the boss. It was like, he was off in the distance. There was like, you know, light behind him and there's a shadowy figure. And it was almost like the wizard of Oz. And I just don't see that same level of uh, deference that young workers are having for their, their employers. 
And I don't know if that's because job security is so much better now than it was, or if the fact is they go, oh, if I get fired, I can go move in with my parents, or um, if, if they're, they're just making so much money that they think that they just go to the next job and do the same thing. But there's a level of reckless courage that that the, the, the workforce, at least a percentage of the current workforce is doing, that is somewhat alarming to me, is that uh, the quiet quitting we discussed here a few months ago on the show, and now this coffee badging. I, I, I can't imagine anybody in my peer group thinking that way because it was like, oh my gosh, if I get fired, who's going to feed my kids? Uh, but that doesn't seem to be a real concern for, for some people in the, in the current urban workforce. Yeah, I, I would say that th this is more for people who are, you know, you're single, you're fresh out of college. This isn't going to be your forever job. So you're just you're just doing like the bare minimum. But I'd say people who are there who like need the job are probably not doing this. <clears throat> but, you know, I've also seen people who work remotely, but they're good at their jobs. They do what they do like really well. So, th you know, and they it's just people just know that they're they're not. They're just they're working from home. So I mean, if you're going in just to like manipulate, be like, hey, you know, I'm here, but I'm really going home, um, you know, that might hurt you. But if you're just like, look, I'm doing everything I need to do. I'm doing a really good job at it, and you know, the office policy is that I can work from home. Then I, I don't think it's going to hurt anybody's career. I mean, I think it's just a lot of office policy. But if the office is trying to get you back into the office, and you're like skirting the rules, then I could see how that would uh, um, it, that would definitely hurt you. But like, but like Joe said, yeah, I mean, it, it must be people who don't. Have a lot of people depending on them because you you don't you don't really want to pay fast and loose with your job and get fired and not know how you're going to feed your kids so uh, that's a good point <clears throat> along that line though tom it, it seems like the mature thing to do would be able to privately talk to your boss to say hey, look here's the deal i'm really good at what i do but uh but it's really important to me that i work from home uh can't we work something out as opposed to just doing the coffee badging where you're you're almost being arrogant about it yeah that uh, you're like you're almost you know defying the boss to do something mm -hmm. yeah well that, that's it for episode 99 of farming market so we'll, we'll see you next week we have like two seconds left so all right <laughs> thanks bye-bye <laughs>